In 193 AD, the Romans besieged the city of Byzantium. The great Roman fleet was moored offshore, blockading the city and cutting off its supplies. Then one day, as if sailed by ghosts, the entire fleet moved towards the shore and closer to the enemy's territory. The sails were down and no one was rowing. What was happening? In 190 AD, the Roman Empire was at its peak. It occupied over one and a half million square miles from the Atlantic to the deserts of Arabia. But it was a divided empire. This is the time in the Roman Empire uh, when there are a lot of power struggles and it's not clear uh, who's going to have the upper hand. Forces loyal to the emperor in waiting, Septimus Severus, had blockaded rebel troops in the city of Byzantium, on the site of Istanbul in modern day Turkey. The Byzantines hold out. They hold out for nearly three years. And they're absolutely terrible accounts of, of what conditions were like in the city as they were besieged. They talk about them wetting leather bags and chewing on them to, to try to stay alive, of using women's hair to weave, to make new clothes, to make ropes, um, drinking the, the most rank and foul water. Inside the walls of Byzantium, 30,000 people faced starvation and death. They sought to break the blockade with an attack that would take the Romans completely by surprise. They intended to steal the ships that were holding them hostage. Source documents describe the bold plan. Divers cut their anchors under water, after which they drove the nails into the ship's bottom and with cords attached there too, and running from friendly territory, they would draw the vessel towards them. Hence, one might see the ships approaching shore by themselves, with no oarsmen nor wind to urge them forward. The secret? The ships were stolen by underwater commandos, the ancient equivalent of today's marines. The mission was highly dangerous. The warship was the most expensive and technologically advanced weapon system in the entire ancient world. The ships would have had round-the-clock security, comprised of vigilant lookouts. This would have been the ancient equivalent of the high security surrounding 21st century warships. The task of stealing the ships without being seen meant that the ancient commandos had to remain undetected for the whole time. One glimpse, and not only was the mission doomed, but the entire city would be conquered. But how did the ancient divers remain unobserved beneath the sea, hundreds of years before the invention of underwater breathing technology? The Byzantine divers must have accomplished the feat on a single breath of air. But how did they do it? At the Royal Lifeboat College on the south coast of England, Ancient Discoveries is investigating the techniques and training the Byzantine divers must have used for their underwater mission. Mark Harris is a British champion in a discipline known as free diving. Free divers are like the underwater special forces of the ancient world. Uh, today we've got things like frogmen who use rebreathers, but um, in those days of course they didn't have that equipment. They just had the ability to hold their breath. The advantage of having a freediver unit within a navy would really be the invisibility factor um, of being able to swim distances underwater and not be seen from the surface. A six-foot section of a replica Roman hull has been rigged to a scaffold and lowered into a tank. Mark will test how long he can remain underwater on a single lung full of air. He will also assess how much work he can get done using only Byzantine underwater tools and a weight. This device is called a scandalopetra and was used by the ancient freedivers to descend and provided them with the negative buoyancy that they needed to get there. Mark will have to combine his freediving skills with those of a military frogman. He must cut loose the ship's anchor and attach a rope to the Roman hull. I think my most challenging task, actually, is going to be um, trying to attach this plate onto the side of the hull. The hulls of ships are built to be as smooth as possible to allow them to glide drag-free through the ocean. The ancient commanders would have had to attach a plate to the hull before even attempting to tie on the ropes. 
I've got four nails to drive in, and I think that's going to be quite a tricky job to do. I think with the frogmen, the chances are that they knew that they were putting themselves in a very dangerous situation, and I think there would have been a very high mortality rate. In doing their tasks, they would certainly have been expending a lot of oxygen and had a very high chance of not making it back to the surface. The test is a first. Mark briefs his safety and rescue team. Can I have everyone's attention, please? There is a risk of me having a hypoxic blackout. Now, if that happens, uh, what I need you to do is to get me to the surface as quickly as possible. Grab me from underneath like so, and then secure my chin and hold the back of my neck, and then just bring me right up to the surface. If I'm not conscious within 30 seconds, then we'll ask this Dave here to get involved, and he'll know what to do at that stage. Mark must first prepare his body for the dive with breathing exercises. Really, when I'm breathing up, uh, the main thing is that I'm just oxygenating my, my blood cells, um, I'm lowering my heart rate, and uh, I'm getting something else called the mammalian dive reflex. Mark is optimizing the amount of oxygenated red blood cells in his body. It's likely that the ancient divers of Byzantium may have conditioned their bodies in exactly the same way. Blood that's in your arms and legs gets channeled into the, the core of your body, and also my spleen will start to release more blood cells as well. So I get a good circulation of blood going between my lungs, heart, and brain, which is where it's all needed. Mark's first task is to cut the rope holding the ship's anchor. After 30 seconds below, he's ready for his main challenge, attaching the plate that will hold the rope. To replicate the ancient diver's experience, Mark must continue the next stage using the same breath. Without exertion, Mark can hold his breath underwater for over six minutes. But physical effort generates carbon dioxide in the bloodstream and this could reduce the time he can hold his breath by over half. He has now been underwater for two and a half minutes, pushing his respiratory system to the limit and creating the risk of a shallow water blackout. By now, the ancient diver's lungs would have been extremely painful, yet they needed to continue work as coming to the surface would have risked being spotted. There are a lot of dangers associated with free diving, and the most uh, significant is that of shallow water blackout, which occurs usually as the free diver is ascending to the surface. Now, on the way up, the lungs expand, because as gases have less pressure exerted upon them, they occupy more space. Now, this has the effect of drawing out the remaining oxygen in the tissues into the lungs, and it is the loss of oxygen, or hypoxia, that causes the loss of consciousness. And there usually is no warning of this. After four and a half minutes underwater, the anchor cable is cut, the plate is in place, and Mark has successfully attached the rope. A dozen divers could have attached 12 ropes on a single undetected breath. This would have been enough for the men on shore to pull the ships towards the land. Mission accomplished. Yes, that was definitely successful. Uh, I, th I think it opened my eyes, really, to what the ancient frogman would have been doing. Amazingly, holding one's breath for four and a half minutes while performing physical exercise is four times longer than the average person can hold their breath while sitting still. By using this ingenious method, the Byzantines captured a significant number of Roman warships. But even this could not save their city. They had to leave the protective shelter of their city and seek food, and it was then that the Romans attacked and slaughtered them. The Romans captured the city and razed it to the ground. Byzantium was rebuilt, rebuilt by Rome, and it would again become the capital of the Roman Empire when Constantine converted to Christianity, and its name got changed to Constantinople, and it still stands today as Istanbul, that city that sits on the brink between east and west. In every era, special forces are called upon to fight in extreme situations. Andrew Lambert and Richard Windley are investigating a device that was made for another extreme terrain, the jungles of Southeast Asia. This specialist weapon saved an entire empire from total destruction. The jungle can be cramped and claustrophobic, 
there's no room to maneuver heavy infantry or large assault weapons through dense undergrowth and around massive tree trunks. Jungle warfare calls for stealth, silence, special weapons and forces. You need special training, you need special equipment, you need special experience to fight effectively in the jungle. There is limited evidence from ancient Asia of a mysterious jungle superweapon, one that would allow special forces to operate in silence in the dense tropical undergrowth. Between the 9th and 15th centuries, the Khmer Empire ruled over great swathes of Southeast Asia. And its capital, Angkor, the largest city of the ancient world, covered 1,150 square miles, roughly the size of present-day Los Angeles. It was an ancient superpower. But in the 12th century, the Khmer Empire was nearly destroyed. A small rival kingdom, the Champa from present-day Vietnam, was growing in strength. Armed by the technologically advanced Chinese to the north, they marched into Khmer territory. A simple bow, as used on the back of their attack elephants, only had an effective range of 50 feet. But this was perfect when fired from a fast-moving elephant at a height of 15 feet. But jungle forces operating hundreds of years ago needed a weapon that could be carried and deployed in thick undergrowth, brought up silently into a firing position and fired at a much greater range and with much more power than the simple bow. The ancient jungle elite forces superweapon was the double crossbow. Ancient Discoveries is investigating how this weapon became the key to how two superpowers fought to dominate a 500-year-old world order. Leading model maker Richard Windley has reconstructed this ancient weapon. So Richard, what we got here, it looks like two bows back to front. The idea is we can get a much longer draw uh, with shorter bows so that these things would be useful in confined spaces in, uh, in jungle warfare. On covert missions, the elite forces needed range to shoot at the enemy from a distance. To get range, they needed a more powerful bow. The way to make a bow more powerful is to make it bigger. But a bigger bow is too large and clumsy to deploy in jungle conditions. The answer was to double the power of the bow, not by doubling its length, but by its number, the double bow. That's the one thing that seems to make sense with this. Even if you don't get any more power than with a longer, simpler bow, the sheer fact that you can maneuver it through the jungle is going to give you that critical advantage. Well, that's right. And I think, I think a, a sensible test would be to test one of the bows on its own, strung as a normal bow, and then set it up with, the, with a complete string in the double bow configuration, and then try it again and just compare ranges. The range of the double bow should be greater than that of a single bow, although the double bow's design might make you believe the opposite. The way the bowstring is wrapped around both bows produces a lot of friction that might lessen the power of the double bow. In a normal bow, one's arm simply pulls back the string. But in a double bow, the string must slide over the first bow to pull that back. The friction at this joint could easily make the expensive addition of a second bow hardly worth the effort. As the string slides over the arm of the second bow, it rubs against the wood. This again uses up valuable power that is not being utilized to project the arrow to its target. Right, well that drawer is about 11 or 12 inches. The single bow shot goes 40 feet. Okay, that's the first one. All right. What we've got here is two bows and they're bending in opposite directions to give us a double effect. Can we square now? That's about centered now, yeah. but um, as you can see, we can actually feel the jerking, so we yeah, really are actually getting You can see it right on, these, right on these ends. I think we better pull this together, because those reliefs show two men pulling. The archaeological evidence confirms that the extra power would have required two soldiers to draw the bow. Right, okay, if you'd like to find that. Yeah, yeah. sorry. This is the double bow, let's see how much further it goes. I think we better place that out, Richard. Yes, that looks significantly better, doesn't it? it does. 
The arrow from the double bow travels 65 feet. We're looking at at least a 50% increase. So what we've got here is a machine that gives us 50% more power with yeah. no extra width. That's right. Even with the energy lost at the friction point, the double bow has 50% more range than the single bow. A militarily effective improvement, this extra power also gave it another advantage. The only problem we've got, of course, in a jungle, you're going to lose performance because you're firing through trees, you're firing through leaves. So what we really need to do, I think, is to look at just how well this works in a jungle situation. The dense foliage that the Khmer and Champa were fighting in produced obstacles between the weapon and the target, barriers that could slow down the arrow and render it less effective. To recreate these conditions, Richard and Andrew have set up a series of targets three feet apart, an approximation of the gap between leaves and branches in a Southeast Asian jungle. Real leaves and branches are of varying thicknesses, but Richard and Andrew are using thick paper for the test because it has a uniform thickness. In this way, they can collect accurate scientific and measurable comparative data about the arrow's penetration. That was fantastic, the ripples we went through. That was brilliant, we've just gone through all seven of them, straight through and out the other side with almost no loss of power. So as a jungle fighting weapon, this really does work. It's gonna cut through leaves, it's gonna hit the target at the other end. So, good idea. To everyone's surprise, the boat flies through every layer with insignificant loss of power. The tests have revealed why the double bow was so effective in the jungle. It achieved 50% more power and range than a single bow, without any addition to its length. It was silent. It could punch through leaves, and it could send its deadly arrow into a distant enemy target in a similar way to modern elite snipers operating in jungles today. With the new Chinese technology, the Champers gained a tactical advantage. They fought all the way into the Khmer capital and killed their king. But the mystery deepens. In spite of this elite weapon, we know the Khmer Empire defeated the Champa uprisings and thrived for another 200 years. Did the double bow have a beatable weakness, a mechanical flaw? The Khmer are one of the more intangible, tantalizing mysteries of history. This is a people who haven't left us any great written record. They've left us visuals, they've left us some enormous temple buildings with elaborate carved images on. These ancient temple reliefs at Angkor Thom depict the Khmer and Champa forces going into battle. They hold the secret. And on those temple stele, we see some very interesting things. They changed their weapons technology during the building of the temples, during the war. And one of the things they introduce is a double bow. This suggests that the Khmer beat the Champa with their own weapon. What we know is that the Chinese sent this technology to the Champa, but Champa deserters carried it to the Khmer. And the Khmer then made a point of celebrating this technology on their temple walls and celebrating the fact that it was Champa deserters who'd brought it over. The Khmer obtained enemy technology and turned it against the Champa, and so saved their empire. A short distance across the ocean from Cambodia lies the island nation of Japan. In the 13th century AD, Japanese military engineers also used an amazing piece of weapons technology to save their nation from annihilation. A weapon that is still famous today for being the sharpest and most deadly blade ever made, the fabled samurai sword. Even with all the technology that we have and all the machinery, we cannot make a sword like it was made many centuries ago. The sword was made with ingenuity and incredible craftsmanship. In 1281, the great Mongol leader, Kublai Khan, sent a force from China of 4,000 ships and 200,000 men to invade Japan. The largest fleets ever put together in the medieval world were those that Kublai Khan produced for his invasions of Japan in 1274 and 1281. This was probably the largest naval flotilla ever assembled prior to D-Day. The 
Mongol raids into Japan in the 13th century are chronicled on a set of manuscripts known as the Moko Shurai Ekotoba. Before this campaign, typical Japanese battles were fought between individual champions and generals. But the Mongols were a tribal equestrian people, and they attacked in mass groups. Up until this point, simple Japanese swords had been made of a single piece of iron hammered into a sharp blade. There was a trade-off between hard and sharp blades made of steel that could cut through Mongol armor but broke easily, and softer, more flexible blades made of iron. Although the iron blades did not break as often, they could not penetrate the stiff, lacquered leather protection worn by the Mongols. The Japanese desperately needed a new technology, a special weapon that would complement the samurai reputation of being an elite special force. The nation stood on the brink of disaster. And that was about the time when the first true swordsmith found a way to make a sword that could be very strong to cut through, but soft and flexible and fast at the same time. Um, and that person was called Masamune. Masamune created the hardest, toughest and sharpest swords the world has ever seen. Faye is one of the highest ranking female martial artists and swordswomen in the world. She is an advanced practitioner of Aido, the art of drawing the sword, and Tamashigiri, the art of cutting with it. But how did the great swordsmith Masamune manage to create such a deadly weapon? His genius was in combining the properties of hard and sharp with tough and flexible. The fabulous thing about Japanese swords is the way in which they combine iron and steel together. Um, the steel is important because it's the hardenable component. You can get a great deal of hardness on that edge, but if you harden too much, then the sword will become brittle. What was Masamune's secret? How did he combine these metals to create the greatest sword the world has ever known? David Starley of the Royal Armouries in Leeds has been examining a cross-section of an ancient samurai sword under the microscope. The cross-sections we've looked at, we've seen a piece of steel that's been wrapped around the outside and just hardened purely on the cutting edge. The sword has clearly been quenched very effectively to give hardnesses equivalent to a modern razor. The iron is impossible to over-harden, therefore the blade remains tough, as well as having the hard cutting edge. The secret was in the tempering, heating a metal and then cooling it. Tempering defines whether ferrous metal becomes iron or steel. Blades were covered with a lost secret formula of clays and charcoals of differing thicknesses, thinner at the sharp end and thicker at the spine. The clay coating acted as an insulator so that the heating and cooling rate changed along the length of the blade. By doing this and hammering out any air bubbles that could weaken the metal, swordsmiths could actually create the two different metals with their different properties in the same blade. It was this stroke of genius that created the incredible samurai sword, the elite special weapon that allowed the samurai to repel the Mongol invaders. the sword would go on to define their status as an elite force for the next 300 years and became the most legendary and deadly sword in the history of warfare. But the secrets of some ancient weapons can remain a mystery, even today. In ancient Rome, there's evidence that the army used dogs in war. But what was their training and how were they deployed? Ancient Discoveries is investigating the secrets of how elite Roman units might have unleashed their dogs of war. From the war elephant tanks of Southeast Asia, to the heavily armored troops charging on horseback across the medieval battlefield, all armies across history have employed animals in war. But a mystery endures about the ancient wartime use of the most popular domestic animal in the world, the dog.
The canine tooth of a fully grown mastiff can reach up to two inches long. It's one of the oldest breeds of dog in the world, weighing up to 60 pounds. This makes such a dog an ideal special forces weapon. In 1513, Henry VIII of England made a presentation of 400 mastiffs to Philip the King of Spain. And we know that Philip the King of Spain used those mastiffs on mass. Can you imagine a pack of 400 snarling mastiffs going at the enemy? He used them at the Battle of Valencia and they drove the French mastiffs from the field. So we've got two armies using mastiffs. Extraordinary. But what of the Roman dog units? One of the most frustrating things about trying to look at dogs in the Roman military is the Romans just haven't written enough down for us. And the Romans, they write everything down. We know so many details about life in the Roman army, but not much about how they use dogs. We know they did use dogs, there's reference to dogs, and there are certainly images of dogs, and there are images of dogs in battle, but they don't tell us how. But on the column of Marcus Aurelius in Rome, there are clues as to how the Romans used military dogs. Marcus Aurelius was one of Rome's greatest emperors. He won several military campaigns against the barbarian tribes on Rome's northern borders, but was also a great philosopher whose writings are still studied today. He ruled between 161 and 180 AD. The column was commissioned to celebrate his achievements. There is one scene from the Marcus Aurelius column of this you know, emperor which shows two dogs together um, near military figures, including the emperor and so on. According to 17th century accounts describing the column, it illustrated an extraordinary tactic used in battle by Roman dog units. The dogs would be unleashed, and just as they arrived at the front rank of the enemy, Roman archers would let fly their arrows. It's a controversial theory. So that as the enemy lifted their shields to defend themselves against the arrow storm, then the dogs would come in and seize their legs. I don't think I've ever heard such implausible, ridiculous nonsense in my life. It, it just doesn't begin to be a possibility. The risk of your own dog being hit by the arrow storm if it was just a few feet short, it, 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 you know, it doesn't begin to make sense. So that's that doesn't help us. Unfortunately, in the course of preservation and restoration of the column since the 17th century, these scenes have been erased, so ancient discoveries cannot verify this evidence. Since we don't know the answers, we need to go to Italy ourselves. Mike Lodes has traveled to Rome to investigate the last remaining breeds of this ancient dog. Dogs like these could have been bred by Roman military dog handlers. These are mastiffs. They're sniffing me. I hope they're not checking out their next meal. They're not pet dogs. These are guard dogs. They're big, ferocious, brave, fierce dogs. And they're the sort of dogs that might have been around in ancient Rome. Certainly, Roman writers such as Pliny talk about uh, big dogs that were around in the ancient world that were used in battle. He talks about them having troops of dogs. So, I mean, this is intimidating enough, just having uh, half a dozen here with a handler. But imagine a great troop of dogs slathering and snarling and coming for you. Huge value um, for intimidation in a military sense. It takes almost superhuman strength to rein in five massive dogs. Is this a clue as to the size of a unit under one dog handler? Now, this is an extraordinary feeling. They've just given me these five mastiffs to hold, which I think can pretty much do as they like, and they pretty much are doing as they like. But I think a trained handler, probably with a big stick, because the Romans weren't terribly friendly to their animals, could probably take four or five on a leash like this and go in. So they're not taking them as one. I, can, I see this as a handler going in with a whole fistful of mastiffs to intimidate and take out the enemy. The investigation suggests that if they did, it might have been beasts like these, in groups of up to five with a single handler. Rome must have used them more than Rome is letting on to us. But the way they were used remains a tantalizing mystery. Somehow, somewhere, for some reason, Rome is keeping a secret. I'm sure one day we will unearth some new bit of evidence. We just need one more clue to tell us what did the dog do for Rome. As yet, 
there is no archaeological evidence about canine special forces. However, vast amounts of historical evidence does exist about the samurai, those elite warriors of antiquity. Although even with them, there remain some intriguing mysteries and startling facts can still be uncovered. Yes, they had swords, but it wasn't their weapon of first choice. Their principal weapon was the horse and the bow. They were mounted archers. And in the age of the horse and the bow, where for centuries this ruled the battlefield, certain elite warriors, bodyguards and messengers, had a device called a horo. It was a special kind of flag, and allegedly it could stop arrows. Ancient Discoveries is investigating this implausible protective device. Can a team of leading experts unravel the mystery of how a simple piece of fabric was able to protect the samurai from a hail of arrows? Often outnumbered, relying on surprise and speed, special forces depend on superior equipment to carry out and survive their mission. In the ancient world, it was no different. Elite warriors wore the best protection they could afford. Perhaps the most extraordinary is what appears to be nothing more than a silk bedsheet. It's known as the Horo. It's shown in illustrations in the many ancient texts that chronicle the clan wars that ravaged Japan through the Middle Ages. At the beginning of the 12th century, the Minamoto and Taira families struggled to dominate Japan. Over five years, they clashed in a series of battles known as the Genpei Wars. A screen depicting the Battle of Ichinotani shows some Minamoto samurai wearing the Horo. The Horo was a cape worn by elite troops and decorated with emblems to indicate status or allegiance. But a mysterious secondary use is indicated by its translated name in English, Arrow Catcher or Arrow Entangler. In its time, the arrow was the deadliest distance weapon on the battlefield. The elaborate dress of commanders and elite troops made them distinctive targets. In terms of sort of application, arrows and bullets fill the same niche in warfare. But in terms of the sort of materials that you might use to stop them, they're slightly different. Armor to protect against arrows was generally made of a hard, impenetrable material like metal or lacquered leather. So how could a piece of silk tied on with string give anywhere near the same level of protection? 3D analyst James Dean is investigating the physics of how a simple piece of cloth might stop a deadly arrow moving at over 80 miles per hour. And as the samurai is riding along, this layer of silk is billowing out behind him. And if we look at the fine structure of the silk, we can see that it's a very fine weave, which has two advantages. One, it's um, a very soft material, which means that the material will envelop the arrow. And secondly, it means that it's the tight weave prevents air getting through it. So it means that when we try and move it, it's creating a lot of drag and it's trying to resist that movement. And if we go back to the wider view, we can see what happens when we release an arrow into the structure. And if it goes in there, then as soon as we make contact here, we can see that the fabric is deforming and it's completely enveloped the arrow. And instead of just the tip of the arrow creating a, a very sharp contact point, here we can see that the, there's lots of points of contact. The material is, is completely wrapped around the head of the arrow and the shaft and flights are also causing drag. And this means that the arrow and all of its kinetic energy are now trying to drag the material along with it. And by the time we get close to the rider, we can see that the kinetic energy is completely dissipated and the arrow falls to the ground before it's made contact. But did the masters of the battlefield trust their lives to this theory? So, Richard, let's see what you've done with this. Aha! Uh -huh. That looks like a horror to me, but I don't think that would work. This is like a lampshade. That material is so tall. Yeah, well, we think this is the last version of it in its sort of ceremonial form. So that's imitating the billow yeah. um, when you're standing in a parade static. And this one's cotton. This one's cotton. And of course, we can see here the Japanese heraldry here. So, I mean, that's the other function of this. Yes. I mean, it is an identifier. So, if we've got to simulate that on the back, that's a heck of a lot of material to billow. Isn't it is it? quite a lot of material. I, mean, I can just feel the weight of this. We're going to need a bit of a supercharged horse to get that to billow wow. out. But 
there are translations that I've read that say cotton, but others that say silk. The, the silk one's a very different beast altogether. Uh, much, much lighter. Oh, God, I can feel this that. is more akin to sort of modern or 20th you know century end. parachute silk. It needs very, very little air movement for that. Oh, look at that. There we go. There. Yeah. Samurai airbags. That's what we need. That's fantastic. I can see it functioning. What I can't really see is I can't see it stopping an arrow. What do you think? Well, one wouldn't think that that would have any resistance to an arrow. It doesn't seem very likely, does it? It doesn't. Well, I think the first thing to do it's is to thing. test it, um, and I think not on me. So, <laughs> <laughs> wind machines, what's occurring to me. Mike has brought his samurai bow to the Ancient Discoveries testing ground. It might be that the Horo doesn't stop an arrow, but it slows it down enough that it will no longer penetrate the armor. So we're going to test it against this um, ballistic jelly, which is supposed to simulate the density and resistance of human flesh. That really does seem to have gone in quite... Oh, look at that. Really quite a long way. So that's a killing wound. Let's see if the horror will save my life. Silk is a famously light and strong material, but can it stop an arrow flying at 80 miles per hour? Testing his archery skills, Mike is surprised to discover an unanticipated feature of a horror billowing in the breeze. But if you look at it now, it's, it's sort of dancing. And especially with the mom, that's the heraldry on the back, is dancing about. So what would be a good aiming point for an archer is now confusing him considerably. That's, that's actually very difficult to aim at. That's amazing! You can see it's work! Completely unbelievable. What would you fantastic. call that? You call it entangled. I would call it entangled, but also a stop. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that had, that it, it completely exceeded my expectations. I'd say the point's still gone through, but I mean, it's the shaft. It's stopped the shaft. It's extraordinary. It's genuinely surprising. It really is, isn't it? See, that, that's a sort of an armor piercing little, you know, narrow, bodkin y type yeah. arrow yeah, yeah, because yeah. he would be wearing armor. The next test oh. is to try a big broadhead, a cutting head. Maybe the broadhead will cut the silk. Pretty good, I think. Look at that. It's done what I predicted. It has cut through the silk. But then once it was in the silk, the weight of the shaft just dropped that silk down. Yes, that's right. So it came through, it used all its energy by then, and then it just dropped down. And these guys are going to be partially armoured anyway, aren't they? Exactly. We just want to resist the fatal penetration of armour. An ancient warrior fleeing for his life would have been lucky to have had only one arrow to contend with. Mike and Richard are building up a picture of how the horror would have protected a rider from numerous arrows fired from various angles and ranges. It's been both fascinating and frustrating at the same time. It was slowing them down. I mean, sometimes it was even just punching them out, like as if it was a trampoline. And yet there were others that did get through, and they went right through, completely defeated it, and hit this with a great smack. The horror in Mike and Richard's test successfully deflected 70% of the arrows fired at it. Mike feels this is an acceptable success rate for such a light and mobile protection. And good enough for him to test it in person, he will replicate the experience of a samurai warrior 700 years ago, on horseback being chased by a cavalry archer. It's going to be interesting. I've never heard of anyone ever trying this experiment before. It may work, it may not. It's a piece of material. It should, to me, the arrow should defeat it. But the Japanese had it for a long time. That gives an idea it has an effect. To ensure the safety of the horse, the arrows have been blunted.
was great. Good shot, good shooting. So we've established the principle works. We've tested it on the wind machine. We can see that unless it's at extreme close range, it works. And now we've tested it on horseback and I could feel it, I could hear it pop. I could sense it was saving me. I could feel it working. So I, I would feel quite secure with that, although, as you say, it's a big target, which is slightly counterintuitive for something that's to protect you, it's actually announcing this great target, but that's so much in Japanese culture. But I mean, they would wear banners and standards on their backs, so they were really big into announcing who they were, and this does that. Yeah. But the important thing is, we've found a principle that works. The samurai were equipped with superlative weapons and ingenious protection. They were trained in mind and body. They were daring and courageous. They were the special forces of their day. The combat divers of Byzantium, the jungle archers of the Khmer, the war dogs of Rome and the samurai of Japan were the titans of elite warfare. Operating in small, close-knit, highly trained units, their effectiveness was out of proportion to their numbers. Ancient discoveries has revealed how the special forces of the ancient world, like their modern-day counterparts, depended on exhaustive training, both mental and physical, and equipment that tested the limits of both ingenuity and craftsmanship.